Open your Bibles and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17. We're going to look at this a lot tonight. We're going to read a good part of this chapter together. Um, Richard read from the 16th chapter of 1 Samuel. And probably there is no story that's more familiar to us nor more universally applied than the story of David and Goliath. Sadly, when the story is, is applied in sports metaphors and business metaphors and things of that nature, it's not told completely. Because we know that the point of the story is it's not David, it's David with God's help. In the 16th chapter of 1 Samuel, Samuel is sent to Jesse's house in order to anoint a new king. He's a little worried about doing it because he's, a, he's scared um, that, Sam, or that Saul is going to find out what, exactly what it is that he's doing and perhaps kill him. God says, don't worry about that part. I want you to take a heifer. I want you to go offer a sacrifice, and I want you to invite Jesse and his family to that sacrifice. Because from Jesse's sons, I'm going to anoint a new king. And so Samuel does that, and he gets there, and the city is kind of worried about it when they see Samuel coming, not sure exactly why he's there, and he says, don't worry, I'm here to do a sacrifice. Jesse is there. Jesse's oldest son, Eliab, is there. And Samuel immediately thinks that this oldest son, Eliab, is going to be the next king of Israel, and God says, no, Samuel, that's not who I have in mind. I've already been for this kingly-looking guy once that hadn't gone all that well, has he? And so Samuel asks Jesse if there are any more sons, and Jesse says, yes, there are. And so seven of Jesse's sons go before Samuel, and still Samuel has not been told by God that one of them will be the next king. And Samuel asks the question, and he says, Jesse, do you have any more sons? And Jesse said, well, yeah, I do. I have one more. He's out in the field. He's a shepherd. Would you get him, please? And Jesse does. And as soon as he comes into the room or into the area, God tells Samuel, this is the one I want you to anoint. He says, we don't, or God tells Samuel, I don't look at physical appearances. I don't look at things the same way that man does. I look into his heart. And of course, we know the rest of that story, right? David was that man who was after God's own heart. He had the qualities that God was looking for in that of a king, that being a shepherd. Turn to chapter 17, verse 1. I want to read the first 11 verses. Now the Philistine gathered their armies together to battle, and were gathered at Socah, which belongs to Judah. They encamped between Socah and Azekah, and Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together, and they encamped in the valley of Elah, and they drew up in battle array against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side with a valley between them. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath, from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Do you know how tall that is? Nine feet, nine inches. What I want you to do is think Tim Maubacher and add three feet to him. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of that coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. That's 125 pounds. And he had a bronze armor on his legs, and he had a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels. That's 15 pounds. And a shield bearer went before him. Then he stood and he cried out to the armies of Israel, and he said to them, Why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. 
And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all of Israel had heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and they were greatly afraid. You know, Jesse's three oldest sons, including Eliab, were in Saul's army. And they were there every day as Goliath issued this challenge to the Israelites. They heard what Goliath said. Those three sons were also there when Samuel anointed David to be the next king. I wonder sometimes if they didn't have some conflict. They knew who their king was. It was King Saul. But they had watched their brother not long before be anointed as king. And we know, we see it in the scripture here, Eliab at least had a little bit of problem with David. You know, David was the youngest, Eliab was the oldest. Sometimes we know how that goes between the oldest sibling and the youngest. But when Samuel anointed David, the scripture says that the spirit of the Lord came upon him that very day. You know, if that spirit was a visible thing, Eliab saw it. And if Eliab saw it, well, you would think he would have a little more faith. In the middle of part of chapter 17, Jesse asked David to go to the front lines, take grain to your brothers, take some bread and some grain to your brothers, and take some cheeses to the captain. Check on your brothers, see about their well-being, come back and give me a report. And David does that. He goes to the battle line. He goes to find his brothers. He's talking with those that are around him, including uh, at least Eliab. And he hears Goliath make the challenge. And in what is one of my favorite verses in all the Bible, chapter 17, verse 26, David, to these men that he's talking with, and within earshot of his brother Eliab, he hears, uh, or David himself says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? It's a good question, isn't it? What about when we have issues? We think that we have problems. We have God. Israel had God. David seems to be the only one that remembered it. Turn later in this chapter to verse 40, and let's read some more. Then he took his staff in his hand, and he chose for himself five smooth stones. And he put the stones in his shepherd's bag, in a pouch which he had, and his sling was in his hand. And he drew near to the Philistine. So the Philistine came and he began drawing near to David. And the man who bore the shield went before him. And when the Philistines looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth. So the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me. And I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. A little bit of trash talk on the part of Goliath. Then David said to the Philistine, You come near to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. You notice the difference, right? Goliath is talking from whom? Goliath. David is talking from whom? God. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all of this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. And so it was when the Philistine arose and he came and he drew near to meet David, that David hurried and ran towards 
the army to meet the Philistines. Then David put his hand in his bag and he took out a stone and he slung it and he struck the Philistine in the forehead so that the, t- the stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the earth. Life hands all of us from time to time a nine foot nine inch giant. If we listen to those around us many times, we will be fearful just like the Israelites were, because for whatever reason, they forgot that God was on their side. David won because he didn't forget that God was on his side. He chose five smooth stones from the brook in the valley of Elah, and God gives us five smooth stones to fight our problems. The first one that I want to talk about is the stone of faith. In verse 36 and 37 of this same 17th chapter, David says to Saul, as Saul is trying to get, put his armor on him, he says, Your servant, this is David speaking, has killed both the lion and the bear, and the uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, since he has taunted the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and may the Lord be with you. When we know that the Lord has been with us before in the problems that we've had, we know that if we want Him to be with us, He will be. He will be with us through every struggle and every problem. And every problem that we face in life, if we include God in it, we know that He will not forsake us, and we have that experience to fall back on. The Lord's brother James says in the very first chapter of his epistle that testing of our faith produces patience and that patience brings about perfect work. Testing allows us to have confidence of exactly where our faith is. And David of all people understood the valley of death. Later in David's life when he penned the 23rd Psalm, he said, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for I know what? You are with me. God can do what man cannot do. In Psalms chapter 20, David again wrote, Some boast in chariots and some in horses, but we will boast in the name of our Lord, our God. You know, Goliath did a little bit of trash talking. Athletes and others are pretty good about doing that kind of thing. I read this and I think about a lot of the baseball teams I coached years and years ago from the time that my oldest son was five until the youngest son was 16 or 17. And occasionally I would have a kid who would decide that he wanted to win the ball game with his mouth. You've all had some like that, right? You've been around some of those kind of kids. And I would have to remind him that that's not why we're here. We're going to win this game with our ball and our bat. And then I would tell the kids, and this is going to date me, but I would tell the kids, I said, there's only two athletes that can tell you they're going to beat you and then back it up, and that's Joe Namath and Muhammad Ali. Half of us may not even remember who Joe Namath and Muhammad Ali is. And certainly no kid that I told that today would remember that. But the point was, they didn't need to go out there and try to win that game by using their mouth. David went out and he talked back to Goliath, but he talked to Goliath and told him that God was going to take care of this problem, not that he, David, was going to take care of this problem. David knew because he had received assurance in the past that God would not hold or withhold from him in this matter of facing this particular giant. Faith is an everyday, ongoing work in progress. The second stone that I want to talk about is the stone of hope. The God of Israel stands in sharpest contrast to the God of the Philistines and the God of all the other countries around. The God of Israel is a living God. The God of the Philistines and others was a God made from human hands and human imaginations. Only the living God is able to accomplish his purposes 
both in Israel and throughout all the world. In verse 37, which we read a few minutes ago, David said, The same Lord who delivered him from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear would also deliver him from the hands of Goliath. And certainly we see that to be the case. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16, Paul said, At my first defense, no one supported me, but all deserted me. Don't count it against them. But the Lord stood with me, and he strengthened me, so that through me the proclamation might be fully accomplished, that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was rescued out of the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone. And he struck the Philistine and he killed him. And there was no sword in the hand of David. Then David ran and he stood over the Philistine and he took his sword and he drew it out of its sheath and he killed him and cut off his head. And when the Philistines saw this, their, that their champion was dead, they fled. Verse 50 and 51. Saul's army had no hope of victory because they had lost all faith. When David got to the camp, Scripture says that Saul's army and the Philistine army were drawn in battle array, facing each other with only, valley, which only, with only the valley in between them. Think about what these soldiers did every single day. They got up. It was a day for battle. They put on their armor. They got their sword. They put on their helmet. They got their shield. They got ready to go to the front line to fight because that's what armies do. And then out from the valley floor comes Goliath. And he challenges them. And they shrink. When they got to that battle line, do you think that their captains and perhaps even King Saul came and got them excited and pumped up and gave them a pep talk and says, Men, today we go into the battle for God. And then Goliath comes out. And they shrink. They were cowards. This fear ran downhill from Saul. Is it a wonder that Saul was being replaced as king? David restored that hope that they had and reminded them in a very graphic way that our God is bigger than a nine foot, nine inch giant. And our God does not, does not care, uh, care how heavy his spear was or how big his shield was or how heavy his coat of armor was. Israel has hope because a shepherd had a stone of faith and a stone of hope. How much more so do we have the hope of eternal victory in heaven because of our Lord and Savior's sacrifice? Our third stone, the stone of love. In our world today, Christians, God, the Bible, the church, we're all under attack. We're belittled. We're accused of spreading hate when in fact we spread love. It is a campaign of misinformation and propaganda. When we, def we defend what we love, we fight for what we love. David fought out of his love for God. God fights for those that love him. Regardless of the circumstance, can we ever forget? We must not forget. I don't, it doesn't matter who believes us. We have the truth. We know we have it. It's God's word. And we must fight for it. 2 Corinthians chapter 16, 9 says, The eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout all the earth, searching for those whose hearts are blameless towards God. Remember what God told Samuel? He looks into the heart. We're going to do something that we don't do a lot anymore in worship. Can you read that on the board, by the way?
We're going to read this, the 23rd Psalm together using this so that we're all from the same version. Read it with me, verbally, out loud. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Our fourth stone, the stone of grace, God uses, God gives us the gifts that we need to use for every trial. Saul tried to put on David's armor, and it didn't work for him. David used what he had been given by the grace of God. A shepherd carried a bag for food and other supplies. He carried a rod, a staff, and a sling. And a sling in this particular case was a pretty powerful weapon, wasn't it? You know, in Judges chapter 20 of the men of Gibeah, it said there were 700 chosen men who were all left-handed and could all sling a stone and not miss a hair. It's a pretty good shot. David's target was a little bit bigger than a hair. He had a nine-foot, nine-inch giant. You ever think about how big the head of a nine-foot, nine-inch giant must be? And he put that stone right in the middle of his forehead, and he fell. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 38, then Saul clothed David with his garments. He put a bronze helmet on his head, and he clothed him with armor. David girded his sword over his armor, and he tried to walk, but he had not tested them. And he said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. And David took them off, and he took his stick in his hand, and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook, and he put them in his shepherd's bag, which he had even in his pouch, and his sling was in his hand, and he approached the Philistine. God will clothe us too. We all have talents. We should never belittle ourselves. God did not create us to wallow in our own self-pity. Lastly, the stone of prayer. In verse 45, David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin. I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Goliath had been doing this for 40 days. Goliath had won the battle. Israel just refused to accept it, at least until David got there. In Matthew chapter 21, verse 18, this is Jesus, speaking of Jesus. Now in the morning when he, Jesus, was returning to the city, he became hungry. Seeing a lone fig tree by the road, he came to it. He found nothing on it except leaves. And he said to it, No longer shall there ever be any fruit on you. And the fig tree withered. Seeing this, his disciples were amazed. And they said, How did this fig tree wither all at once? And Jesus answered, and he said to them, Truly I say to you, that if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but even say to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, and it will happen. And all things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. In James chapter 5, verse 16, he's talking about Elijah. Elijah had prayed. Elijah and Ahab had a little thing going, if you remember that. They didn't get along very well. And Elijah prayed for a drought, and a drought came. And then later, after Elijah and the 450 prophets of Baal had a little confrontation on Mount Carmel, Elijah prayed again for it to rain. James says this about Elijah. And Elijah was a man with a nature just like ours. I want us to let that sink in. Elijah, prophet of God, was a man just like us. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. 
And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. You know, this congregation believes in prayer. We see it every Wednesday night in family prayer with the countless cards uh, that are turned in asking God to intervene in our lives. In our shepherd's praying time that we're doing this month in adult three, last week we had 20 plus, tonight we had 20 plus. Just to pray. Do we underestimate sometimes how uplifting prayer is? Not only for those who are being prayed for, but also to those who are doing the praying and for those who are making the request. I don't really think we underestimate it. Every Wednesday night when there's 15 or 20 or more cards turned in, this congregation asks for God to intervene in the lives of family, friends, sometimes people that we don't even know. It's a powerful thing. Do not let the struggles and the troubles that you face overcome God. He puts these stones in our pouch so that we may defend ourselves against giants. God wants us to submit to Him. He loves us. And that love is conditional upon obedience. We know this. John 14, 15 and a host of other scriptures tells us this. You may be here tonight, and you may love the Lord, Lord with all your heart, but you have not taken that step of obedience to be baptized, to submit to God through immersion. You may believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You may recognize that you have sin in your life and that you have a need for repentance. You may be willing to confess publicly that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And upon doing that, be baptized for the remission of your sins. And then live a life faithful to God thereafter. You may also be here tonight and perhaps you've wandered from the truth. Perhaps you feel that you need to be right before God. You need to ask for forgiveness. You need to come back and recommit yourself to God. Whatever the reason... We offer an invitation song for that purpose. Will you come as we stand and sing?